I get the uh, privilege of introducing Camille uh, briefly before she uh, starts talking. I, I did. I had a quick look at your background. I didn't realize you had a chemistry uh, bachelor's uh, degree, um, which which interesting. Um, uh, but 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 since then, I've uh, had uh, studied in, in education and made some really substantial contributions um, in the space of education, as well as the research on young people's lives, uh, Pacifica young people in particular, um, and obviously in relation to the talk today, uh, understanding the experiences of young African New Zealanders. I know also that Camille is a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit, recognising exactly those um, those contributions that she's made. And I, I noticed also it drew the ire of Cameron Slater, of all people, <laughs> um, for, a, for a period of time, which I think is something to be congratulated on. If you can upset Cameron Slater, then you're obviously doing the right thing. Um, so so uh, it, it, it's really great to be able to have you here to give um, this talk. And um, as usual, we keep it pretty relaxed and have a conversation that follows that. Just before you do get going, I noticed that um, Margaret, you, you've joined us. Um, we were just introducing everyone in the room. Uh, would you like to um, introduce yourself before Camille starts? We, we can't hear you because you're on mute, I think. Sorry, I think I'm now unmuted. Uh, my name is Margaret uh, Nyarango. I'm, um, an ex-student of uh, Massey University. I finished my PhD there in 2016. I now work in the private sector in New Zealand, uh, but um, just interested in the, in the topic, uh, being of African descent myself, and also having done research with uh, African people in the course of my academic career. So that's why I've joined. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Um, so yeah, I'll uh, pass it over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Kira everyone and thanks to Francis for us inviting me here and thank you all for coming. Um, I, I, the slide is up there but um, I'm actually not sure who I'm meant to look at. Or <laughs> <laughs> so so, it's got, so um, if I were to look at this group would you guys be okay with that? If I, All right okay. Oh, but it's smiling at me so maybe I'll look at you guys. <laughs> <laughs> because they can see me. Um, the, the research is a, it's about the African youth and the encounters with the police, um, the impact that has had on their family, and um, the strategies they, they use to cope with these encounters with the police. Um, I'm just going to think I do this, no? Sometimes we have to just go to the slide and get should. All right then. Okay, just some brief background. Um, of African statistics in New Zealand, the African population. Maybe I should. Guys, hold a minute. Can we move this down? Mm -hmm. I'm excited to. Just minimize it. Yeah. I can see you. Okay. No, I can't see them. But anyway, I'm pretending I can see you. Um, so the African population in New Zealand had a significant increase from, um, between 2001-2006 by 51% and a small increase of 26%. It's estimated to be around 14,000 um, Africans living in New Zealand, but that has been disputed because um, during the time of, of Mugabe, um, particular political strategies, um, um, Zimbabweans were counted as Europeans and so South Africans. So if you were to look at African population and, and that term apparently is being very contested because uh, some people think that um, people doing research with Africans should use the word black Africans to distinguish between white Africans. I know some of um, my PhD students insist on using the word African rather than black African because they said they were Africans before the whites came in. And if the whites want to say they're white Africans, they should use that term, whereas they are Africans and shouldn't have to use the term black Africans. So in terms of the African population, those that are indigenous um, Africans, they're about, it should, it is about less than 13,000 um, in that figure. The majority of Africans that are here were born overseas, 75%, and most came as um, refugees or migrants. And stop me anytime, I'm, I'm quite happy to 
to be stopped. Africans are young population, median age about 24 years. They live in more crowded circumstances. The one I've seen from the, the kind of communities, the kind of um, uh, lifestyles that they live in. They have a high proportion of one parent households compared to a lot of ethnicities. And that's largely, um, that's particularly um, prominent among those from the refugee background, primarily because New Zealand refugee um, policy, they, seem, they take the vulner, vulnerable people first, which is the women and the children. So the men are left behind. Also, a lot of the fathers or the male figure in the family have um, perished in the wars, unable to come, not located. And so the women and children come. Africans have a high similar rate of qualifications as Europeans. 85% of them, of Africans, have um, tertiary qualifications um, um, or formal qualifications for those 15 years and over, compared to only 78% of Pakeha, yet they have a high unemployment rate, lower mean annual income, and more of them unemployed than Pakeha, and we all know the reasons for that. Well, at least I do. <laughs> this is, I, I said there's almost no literature, but actually I couldn't find any literature, literature at all on the experience of, of the African um, community with the police. And this, the most recent study was the one we carried out in March 2016. And of course, the one that drew the ire of Cameron Slater. And apparently 3,000 bloggers around New Zealand. So this was the research was qualitative data that we did with African youth. We, I consulted prior to this. Actually, how this research came about, a lot of African youth came and spoke with me, um, telling me what was happening um, with the police. I heard one story, I heard the story. They, um, I'm involved with the African community at large. A Kofi before that, what it was called, they had um, a name before, but the, the African community organizations um, I know uh, the, all the different parts, the Maroonie community, the Congolese community, et cetera. So I know a lot of the youth, they came and told me their stories. They said something needed to be done about it. They wanted some research done. Actually, uh, most of the African youth um, have tertiary level qualifications. So they were very much aware of, of, of the need for research in, in these spaces. I consult before I did anything, um, I spoke with uh, the different community organizations, the New Zealand AIDS Foundation, where you find a lot of um, people there that um, liaise with the African community, the African Wealthy Services Trust, etc. So I had carried out um, um, uh, into focus groups with um, five focus groups, African males, 16 to 31 years, two groups of African females, 16 to 28 years, um, mainly because it was the males that were having the experiences and the encounters with the police. Um, so there were 25 males, eight females. Everyone was born in Africa except for two of them. I also interviewed um, community leaders, social workers that were of African heritage. And I should say that most of the people involved in this research, it wasn't just me, it was a, a group of us. All of them were African except for one, Sam one young man and a, a woman from India. Okay, so these were the findings. The Africans, um, youth, and although the youth um, is it's up to 24 in, um, in, in New Zealand, uh, the, the youth here the, um, were from the ages of about oh, 16 to about 32, mainly because those that were 16, the way the African youth hang around, they hang around people older than them sometimes, younger than them. I didn't have, have anyone um, under the age where I, I required parental consent. Um, but because they brought their friends with them, I, I included that group up to 31. There weren't many of them, but there were one or two of them. But they said that um, the police provoked them, would call them niggers, um, call them names, call them dogs. Um, and it was more, they, they thought the police were trying to provoke them and, and, and to provoke them into reacting. Um, they believed that the police ha had um, health stereotypes of them, if they wore hoodies, if they were walking late at night. I do not know if walking late at night constitutes a bad stereotype, but in the police eyes, it, it did. Um, the youth, of course, noticed the differences in how the police treated them compared to how they treated their peers, because a lot of them had actually, even they were born overseas, many of them had grown up in New Zealand 
and they would hang around um, Pakeha youth who would tell them they will, for the same crime, they'll meet at school, they will say they were taken to um, the, the cell, the, the Pakeha boys will say, well, they, they called, the police just called my parents who took me home. Um, so they, they knew about the differences in how they were treated. They said when they tried to assist their, their peers who were being abused by the police, the police charged them with um, obstruction of justice or resisting arrest. The police showed up at their homes at all hours of the morning, searching for somebody who broke their curfew for about an hour, just would barge through the home. Um, not Usually it was just a mother at home or somebody older, which would just strike terror into the hearts of, of the women of the women that were there. Just be just walking home at night, just congregating in parks, they would be approached by the police. Um, sitting in cars, they would be approached by the police. Um, the police um, would tell them if this many times on the North Shore when they were there, the police would tell them, ask them where they lived, that they were if they weren't from the area, police would say they don't belong in this area. Um, they shouldn't be here, they should go back to their own neighborhoods. And they were treated like criminals with things for minor offenses such as traffic violations. Now I should say, um, when I presented the initial findings of this to um, a group of uh, uh, a community leaders as well as youth, they would, uh, there was one policeman in the room there. And um, the, the older African that were there were, were very silent. They didn't want to say anything. Um, and I could see now why the youth didn't go to them because that the, Afri the elder Africans didn't want to, to, in the eyes of the communities, cause trouble or, or stick their necks out. But they were very quiet while I um, did this presentation. And then all of a sudden, one person, an older, one of the older women, told of her experiences. And then one by one, they began recalling all these experiences that had happened to them for the 10, 15 years they had been in New Zealand and they had kept very quiet about it. And I kept thinking to myself, had they said something about it, then maybe something might have been done. But for all these years, the experiences they had encountered with the police mirror the experiences that the youth were encountering. And, um, and um, the one policeman that was there, Rob Stanton, he stood up and said to me, which was really, really surprising, he said, Camille, everything you said there is true. And that was quite a shock because as you can see in the, if you read the blogs, everybody was denying that the police was capable of, of such. And this is a policeman um, saying that he got a lot of flack from his colleagues. But, okay, so the impact on the youth. Um, so all these experiences, how does it impact the youth? Well, there's a lot of hypercriminalization and incarceration. Um, views about incarceration. The, 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 initially, the youth are, are scared in, in meeting the police, but the subsequent encounters have made them less scared, less afraid of, of a prison sentence because they now, they now have a familiarity with the, with the prison system. And compared to what they know of the prisons back in their country, it, it's tame in their minds compared to what they encounter. But they don't realize that still, this still puts them in a disadvantageous situation because once you have a record, it stops you from doing a lot of things. So whether it's a mild um, type of situation here compared with what they know of their situation, all of none of them have ever been in, in, in um, trouble with the law in their country. To come here and be in trouble with the law, it's, it's quite an unsettling thing. The youth was very, very unsuspicious of having any further interactions with the police. They didn't feel safe with, when they saw police, as most people would feel safe when they see the police. They just think, oh, oh what did I do? Um, am I being going to be followed? Am I being stopped? What, what's going on? So they saw the police as using the uniform to intimidate them. Um, the, the police treatment as being racist and a threat to their safety. Walking along sidewalks, on the basketball courts, they're just approached um, by the police. So the research has shown that um, the police presence is more prevalent in, in disadvantaged neighborhoods or neighborhoods with large ethnic communities, and it's no different here. 
the police presence is very heavy in um in in areas with high ethnic communities where Africans are and Africans here also live in the low decile areas where there's also very heavy police presence. Um, the youths, the the youth, the youth have learned to resist, but they also react. And and um, being young people, and I, I think um, I don't think the police are unaware that when you provoke young men, the young men will react. And of course, the minute they react, they are arrested um, for disorderly behavior or resisting arrest. It said they weren't seen as in um, as equal members of society because they said they came a lot of them came from refugee war like situation and then one of the, one of the sentences one said was and to be treated here like that it removes you you know and that was a really sort of heartbreaking statement to hear when they think that they don't they feel that they don't belong they made to feel they don't belong in New Zealand um, society because they think that, that why can't they congregate just like they pack it up here as a congregating? What makes them different? That they have to be always looking over their shoulders. And when you think about it, it's a very uncomfortable space to be in when you're walking down the street and you can't be who you are. Um, they, so the family, the impact on family, the family now have, they have, when police come into the homes without knocking and I thought I'm not a lawyer, but I thought you did have to have some sort of warrant. Apparently, they know that the, the African communities are very unaware of the law, and I think it may be why they do these things because there's no, they, they're not the type of people to report these things. So they've seen how the police have reacted and behaved towards the children, and. And they, even though their children may have done something wrong, the youth may have done something wrong, they don't, they didn't intend those type of consequences to occur to their, to their, um, their youth community. So now they're unwilling, very unwilling, very reluctant to call the police. Um, they fear for what will happen to their children if they call the police they, for themselves, even if, um, for some of the women who have been um, um, abused in the home, um, physical abuse in the homes by partners or whatever, they do not call the police just because they are f of, of, they're fearful of the police. So a lot of uh, the police um, encounters with the youth have had impact far beyond just the youth. It has led to even in unsafe situations where um, African communities in, in, um, in whose lives are in danger also do not call the police. So the lack of communication between the family and the police, the, the, the police seeming unawareness of what it means um, to the, the people that they, they, they have these encounters with so makes it very difficult for, for African communities to see the police as anything but a threat or menace um, to the family. And it's not, doesn't only stop there because when other Africans come into New Zealand, the stories they get told from those people. So it, it, it's, it goes now to the new migrants come in, they are warned, stay away from the police, don't call the police. And so their safety is more and more compromised by the community trying to protect the newcomers to New Zealand. Um, it, it's a lot of shame and um, mental ill health, um, the parents and the parents, some youth I spoke to the parents had to them out of the home, then want them around because it's, it's a shame to see because they live in among other Africans and to see that um, the police cars showing up at their home, it brings shame to them and it, they don't go out now to um, social functions where Africans know that the police arrived at their door so they kept in doors because of, of of um, the police encounters with the youth. It's small communities, so the word spreads um, quite widely there, and it has contributed to a lot of ill health and depression, and particularly um, among the mothers who bear the brunt of, of, of um, these impacts of these police encounters. Um, the female members of the family, like the, the, the siblings, the, 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 the sisters, are left then to look after because it's usually the brothers or an uncle or somebody male in trouble and 
it's now the, the younger female siblings who have to manage your schooling, who have to manage employment, who have to manage the care of the brothers that are in prison or incarcerated, and then manage the, the, the mothers who have suffered from this trauma. Um, the community now be, is, is, is aware of, of the, the police profiling them, labeling them. Um, they believe that um, when you uh, target or you arrest one youth, everyone in New Zealand thinks it's all of the African community. They don't limit it to just that individual. So they themselves feel that they targeted as a homogenous group here. Um, the fears for the future, they believe and you know they, they read like everybody else, they see what's going on in America, they see what's going on around the world, they believe that the situation will only get worse. Um, they know that it's not a problem just for them. They are aware of um, police encounters with Māori or the Pacific groups. And they, they, if they, they see that the police aren't openly armed, but they think it, it, because it will be a matter of time before that happens and there will be a lot more deaths because they know that they are more readily targeted by the police than their European or Pakeha counterparts. So they just say the situation is going to get worse, not just for the youth, because, but also for the police if the youth start arming themselves to counter um, the encounters that they have um, with the police. Um, so how do the African youth, uh, am I going too fast? No one has any questions, I don't actually know the time. Um, the time is, it's 11.27, so you've been talking about for 15, 20 minutes. Right, so, okay. so how long? Maybe another 10 minutes. All right, that okay. Okay. no, that's fine. So what are the coping behaviors used by the youth? Well, I've just given a definition by Lazarus and Pope when he says coping is a process by which an individual's cognitive and behavioral efforts are used to manage pressures beyond the resources that they have. And what the youth, in these encounters, what the youth do and how they cope with the police encounters is to be obstructive, they are vigilant, they try to avoid what's happening or they adapt to what's going on. All right, so looking at obstruction, it's an unwillingness to cooperate with the police. Um, some have questioned the police practices, have asked the police why they're being stopped and why they're being arrested. Some of them will taunt the police. The police will come up to them and say, um, do you have a, show me your driver's license? They will say, I don't have a driver's license. And then the police will proceed to give them a fine. And um, then once the police has written it all up, they'll say, oh, I have a driver's license. And then they'll show it. And I asked him why they do that. He said, because the police had no reason to stop them, you know, so they've taken away the power of, of the police in, in a way. Um, and, um, and they know that refusing will just get them into more trouble, but it's the only little bit of retention of their manner that they can hold on to in that respect. Um, some have engaged in, in um, Google and um, physical confrontation with the police. Um, I, I think they, they said they get to a point where their, their dignity is lost and the police do not respect them and therefore they reciprocate in kind by disrespecting the police, even though they know that they will always be on the losing end of this type of encounter. They still do it. They, this is for the younger ones, the older ones now, as you will see later, have adapted in a, in a different way. Um, the African youth believe that their race and their migrant status are the reason for the police attention because police see them all as migrants. I don't know if the police understand, unless the police want to know about it, about the refugee background, that, that makes a difference. But some of the, uh, if you look at our African youth, I just went to a function recently, almost half of them, they were only about 14, 15 and younger, were born in, in um, New Zealand. So police are going to have to kind of and not just police, institutions all over are going to have to change how the, their perceptions or their understandings of this African community because they are no longer, they will no longer at some point be such 75% migrants or those from refugee background. They will have been born here. 
um, the quest in the police, this George, one of the African community workers said he was aware of racism within the police, um, but he said that uh, the African youth were becoming bolder and question in terms of questioning the police. But he also, he, um, George was in West Auckland with a lot of the African um, youth. And um, this is, that's a pseudonym, by the way. Um, and he said that he would be called, he would be called many times to, to uh, the police would call him in many times. And, and often um, they would be, the police would just stop them for having a joint or, or, or stop them and then find a joint on them. Whereas they would let their party have friends who they're hanging out with go on. And, and, um, and then because um, the boys don't want to tell their parents, um, don't want the parents to know they wouldn't give an address, which puts them into even more trouble because if you don't have an address to give the police, then the police have nowhere to, to send you to. So usually they just call George and George has to find someone else. You're as a Pakeha, you don't have, don't, they, first of all, they're not stopped. And if they are, they don't seem to have that, they're not ashamed of calling their, their parents to come and, and help them out. Um, the youth are very vigilant now. They are very much aware of what's going on globally, and it has motivated some of them to learn and understand their rights and the interactions with the police. And they know about recording now. Although um, a lot of bloggers have said, if this was really happening, why didn't um, people record it? And I did ask them that, and they said, Camille, the police are stopping you in your face. The last thing you think about is to record it. If somebody's there, they may do it. But the last, last thing you think about is recording it. And he said, they said to me, those people, um, afterwards, some people who say that they've never been stopped by the police. So they will never know what it's like in that situation. And if they stop, they're usually assisted by the police, whereas we harassed by the police. And there's a difference in what you will do being, between being harassed and being assisted. So their vigilance was demonstrated through their gaining knowledge of the law. They recognize inequalities behind the reasons for the police encounters and protesting against being criminalized. And it was interesting too because um, when this report came out, um, somebody sent me some links to some newspaper, a newspaper in Australia and in, in, um, in the US. And the US headline said, um, African youth encounter, encounters with the police says, shows that racial profiling of our African youth is a global phenomenon, you know, and it was just showing that, and South Africa also had run it, but it was in those places where um, African youth were being stopped, the newspaper was trying to point out, yes, so it's not just in the US, it's happening, it's all over. Um, so they knew the law, some knew that it could complain to the Independent Police Complaints Authority, I'm not sure if it's there, and that's an interesting thing too because um, when the report came out, the, one, the, uh, the police commissioner base here, I don't know what it's called, uh, um, police high person, I don't know what he's called, based in Auckland, he first came out, Chambers was his name, I'm quite happy to name him. On, yeah. um, he said, and the, the policeman who actually supported the youth was Rob Stanton, so I named him. Too. But Richard Seamus came around and said, um, it's nonsense, it's not true. Wally Omaha, who was a Maori police officer, um, he's one of the top people in police, all said, no, it's not true. Um, the youth are lying, it's a small sample, they tried to, to rubbish the, the sample. And, um, and when I gave the findings at another place the, where this Richard Chambers was, he came and attended and then he said to me, well, Camille, you know, the youth, you know, if they're having these experiences, they should come, come and see me. I said, you just in the newspaper telling them that they were lying to you and now you want them to come to you? How is that going to work? And um, Wally, um, I said to him, you should know this has been happening to Mari. What would make you think that it wouldn't happen to our African youth? And he said, Camille, there was a liaison person that I put in that place, a police liaison person. And he said, this is not happening. And so I took my cue from him. I said, well, that's not good enough because this policeman that you put in charge 
is protecting himself. If he's meant to make sure that these things aren't happening and he doesn't know it's, ha it's not happening, of course his, he's not going to want to risk his reputation. And then Wally, to his credit, met with me and said, Look, you know, and he told me about his own experiences as a young police officer, about the police would say, let's go hunt some niggas. So he knew very well what was happening, but he also had to protect the reputation of the police to the wider society. And I said, you push a bunch of youth under the bus to preserve the reputation of police that you know are rogue police. And then another police officer said to me, um, well, I want, you know, do you know the police, you know, um, telling you to, to name names? I said, no, the youth have done all they've done, all they should do, which is to describe their experiences. You know who your police are. You know very well if these youth know, and if this policeman here knows, you know very well who these police are. So you go and you find out those police. Don't ask the youth to do your job for you. And they know very well who the police are. And I actually did give them a couple of names of police, one name in particular. Um, so the youth recognized the inequalities. They knew that. Um, they, would, they receive very different treatment in the course from the Pakeha peers. They have a very different view. Unfortunately, now they're beginning to have a very different view of, of New Zealand society because these youth never, in their countries, of course, never encountered racism. They may have encountered sexism, patriarchy, that sort of thing, but racism is not something that they really encountered until they came here. They didn't want also to be taken as criminals because they knew that the label of being criminal, being criminal sick. And the unfortunate thing is that a lot of youth now are saying the police, they, they will all, they will be assigned a, a legal person who will tell them to, who will tell them to plea bargain. And they will do that because they will think the, the person will tell them they will get a reduced sentence. They get to the court, the judge has a completely different view and it's not what it's promised. And now they ended up they're ending up with records. So the, the move now is to educate the youth. You haven't done anything wrong, don't plea bargain because that's a record. You need to look long term. So that education needs to get out to our youth. They avoid now, um, they try to avoid all contact with the police or the older African youth will say they just go, yes, sir, no, sir. Um, here, you want my wallet, sir? It's, one of them said, I even smile and show my teeth, give me my license just so they could leave me alone. And he said, now they start calling me sir and, and they leave me alone. But it's gotten to that stage. They still know in their hearts that the police are racist, but just to avoid any further confrontation, they do that. The young ones, 18, 19, no, no, not so tolerant. Um, they, some of the youth now have developed what I call a sort of reactive conservatism. They have gotten very religious, especially those that um, adhere to the Muslim faith. They, they now pray, they, they now wear um, Muslim wear when many places, not just um, to the prayer halls, to the mosque. And they, they, um, they now, so they, they said, if we pray, if we do this, we stay away from the police, we just do our business. And so they, they see that as um, a reaction, as sort of a, a, a subtle but passionate response to the practices of the police. But in my view, it seems as if turning away from one authority of the police to another of, of um, religion and Islam. And, um, and you know, you, it's good if they find solace in it, but it's not so good if they remain hidden and away from the rest of, of, of the community, if they, they keep to themselves and that is the only world they know but they're doing whatever they need to protect themselves. Um, unfortunately, the youth have um, adapted to the behaviors. Um, they, they do not acknowledge at all the authority within, within the police. They, they respond with their own acts of bravado. They try to show disdain for the police. Um, they try to show the police that they don't have they, they don't have the power to humiliate and demean them. They're not going to feel humiliated. So, so they adapt in that way. Um, they adapt by, by, by minimizing um, these, polices, these police encounters with them. 
Okay. The unfortunate thing is um, some of them now have become big names among the African youth. Some of the younger brothers are saying, I want to be like my brother. Um, even among the Pacific community, some of the African people who have been in prison have, have become heroes to these people and have told them about the prison system and, and what it's like. So they, just, they remove that sort of fear of, of being in it. And that's never really a good thing because prison is not their home. It's not a place that they should ascribe to want to be. Um, and this knowledge of the law and, and what they can do at what age and what they can get away with, it's good if it's used in a positive way. Unfortunately for some, it's not. So that's it. I think um, the impact of these police encounters, the coping strategies we hope will motivate our youth towards positive social change because they are keen on, they, they see New Zealand as a home and in and, and, and a number of cases too, um, most of the policemen, I don't want to say all because the policeman who stood up for them was white. But most of the policemen have been white and, um, and they've told them to F off and, and go back to their country. I've been told that too. But, and, um, and they have retaliated by telling the police, you're not Maori, so this is not your country either. You know, you, you, if, you, know, you should go back to, and of course that police aren't going to take that very lightly. But they, they came here for a better life, it's how they see it, and to be treated like as less than, to be stopped, um, to be harassed. Um, one of the youth um, who I was interviewing, who I was speaking with, he was relaying an encounter to me that I thought had happened maybe when he was maybe about two or three years ago. And then his colleagues said to him, uh, I said, show Camille, show Camille. And I said, what? And he didn't want to show me, but they told him it did. And just a, a week before he had spoken with me, he had stopped the police because his car had broken down. He called the police, the police came. No, sorry, the police came passing by, they stopped and he thought, they will assist him. But the first thing they did without asking any question was to throw him against the car, handcuff him. And, um, and that's why he didn't want to show me the bruises were still on his hand. And, all he, and they said he had stolen the car. It wasn't his, it put him down on the ground. And, um, and it just totally broke him for that period of time. Uh, because he, he, had, he no longer, of course, trusted the police. But the wounds on his hands, just from handcuffs, I do not know the impact of handcuffs, they were really, really unsightly to look at. And so all these experiences, you know, question, youth question themselves, what is our place here in society? And so this, the needs to be that sort of forum for them to know, well, actually you have as much place to be here as same policemen who are stopping you. But we'll see how that goes. But anyway, that's my talk. Okay. We can bring back yeah, I'll bring that. Okay. Oh, that's one person. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you very, very much, um, Camille, for a, obviously a really um, yeah, um, poignant um, talk in terms of thinking about the kinds of issues and as well the responses, I think, of the police as well. Um, so, um, uh, as usual, I like to ask people outside of this location uh, if they've got questions first before, um, before coming back here. So, um, yeah, um, people outside of the University of Auckland, um, questions for Camille? Or comments, etc. Hi, Camille, it's Robin Peace from Massey here. Um, the oh, I just feel so depressed. Um, the I'll just, just try and turn that up. Sorry, that's me not not talking to my mic. Is that better? I think you try again now, Robin. Is that better? Yes. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I just feel really depressed. Um, and as I said at the beginning, Jeff, who's now joined us, and I are, um, and Jeff is actually doing the work. Um, 
with uh, um, police national headquarters under Wally Homaha to to look at some of the ways in which the police can better understand what's happening within their organization that makes this kind of thing possible. Um, and the, the thing that I just find really always really depressing is that because we've developed a research environment of the kind that we have, that if someone does a piece of research that involves a relatively small sample size, regardless of what comes out of that research, it gets dismissed, or not only dismissed, but actually openly derogated, um, rather than looking at those findings and going, well, if this is happening to a single human being, it's completely unacceptable. What do we need to do to change it? Um, so thank you for um, bringing that back into um, circulation and talking about it again. Um, and Jeff and I may get back in touch with you later. Can um, Robin, if I can respond about the, the sample, I think from what from all research, that is police response to any research. They criticize the methodology, they, and that's usual practice. And and in, in my case, quite I was fortunate to have criminologists rubbish that response by the police. Um, so that was good. But it, um, the same Richard Chambers who said it was a small sample size, I spoke with 34, 33 youth. That's not a small number. I, I, that's a sizable number. There, there was a quantitative online one about 80 something responses, but that was just to get an idea of this, um, of, of what people were seeing. But when um, I saw Richard Chambers after, and I sent out, um, I was checking up, I responded to all of that, and I sent out, I sent out um, readings about sample size to inform the police about um, valid sample size. You know? But I saw Richard Chambers and I said, um, what, um, and I made a comment about the methodology and why he criticized and he kind of looked at me, and it, it occurred to me, he had not even read a report. He did not even read a report. He did not even know what I was talking about, but he just criticized it. And um, anyway, subsequently I had two articles published on it and I sent it back to the same people because actually one of the comments from my own university said um, was that, Camille, if you had got it published before you put it out in the report, you know, we could have supported you. I said to them, you really wanted me to wait two years, a year or two years, while the African you got their heads kicked in just so you will come and support me. I said, I didn't need your support. So back to when the articles did get published, I said, and I said, you're going to support me now? I was a bit cheeky, but you know, um, it, 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 why would you dismiss these youth who are saying things that you know globally to be true? What makes people think New Zealand is any different in terms of its institutional approach to these youth? I've got a question, if that's all right. Um, I was just wondering about whether, um, just yeah, thinking about the kind of... Yourself. Oh, sorry, what was that? <laughs> you might need to introduce yourself. Oh, sorry, my, my name's Jeff Stone. I'm, I'm working with Robin Peace and with the police at the moment on their responsiveness to different communities. And I had a question about, um, two things got, got raised for me is, is Rob Stanton the only person you encountered in police that felt the need to acknowledge what was going on. I mean, you talked about Wally, but but also maybe off somebody who might have offered some attempt at a kind of restoration at the local community level. And the other thing is I was wondering about alternative resolutions. So the extent to which um, African youth get corralled into plea bargaining or something like that, did you encounter any stories where an alternative resolution was offered? Um, in response to the first one, no, uh, Rob wasn't the only one. I am... Um I met a few police officers after that, off the record, but mainly from Pacific Hill communities, Maori communities, who knew what was going on. Um, one attended the forum, and I said to him, it's Joe Tipene, I said, um, Joe, you know who they are. He said, Camille, 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 I love you, but I can't talk to you. Why? 
you know um, what's going on. So, and a few others I mentioned you because you really want it. They all want to do what's best, but they feel um, either they don't hear of it, that's what they say, or, I mean, police talk about gangs. They're the, the biggest gang out because that, their code of silence is so strong. Yeah. So strong. And um, so, yes, a few police um, who have, as I said, many more people who first said, yes, I do, well, yes, it's true. Um, but then the police, I said, well, what's going on there with the police? Because actually, Jeff, I did invite the police to it, and I sent them two, three, four invitations, no response from them. The only time I got a response was when they knew it was going to be in the news, and then they called me. And um, so it, Wally also himself, you know, I think he, he knows what's, what's going on, or now he knows what's going on, because he came to me and said, Camila, I didn't know. I'm thinking, well, if your liaison person goes to all these African functions, and the first thing he notices is that the African youth are all outside when you see the police. That should be an, indi that should be an indication that things aren't okay between the youth and the police. The only people inside of those African functions are older African people with the police. The youth are all outside. When I, we had that forum, there were over 200 African youth all inside. So they will attend with it, but there's not a heavy police dominating the session. And I said to Wally, this your liaison person could have noticed that if he was worth his soul as a police officer. Um, what was the other question, Jeff? Sorry. Oh, it was about alternative, um, um, sort of strong and alternative uh, solutions or resolutions at the moment, trying to keep um, low level offenders out of the court system. And, um, and they are trying to extend that into ethnic communities. So I'm just wondering whether you encountered any um, attempt at that. Sorry, Jeff. No, I didn't. They said um, they would just they would just be taken to the cells for the simplest of reasons. So if it has happened since then, um, um, I do not know. But nothing to me indicated. The only thing that would happen is when they call, they would call in a community worker. But that was just so that they had somebody there standing in from from the court of youth. But would be take, they, would, they said it would just be taken to the cells and um, have to spend the night there. But if that's happening now, I'm really glad to hear. Yeah, well, I suppose, I think it's still a work in progress in pretty early days, but that, that was Wally's intention as he expressed it to me or to the project that I'm working with. I'm glad to hear that. Um, I, by the way, I just I think that research is really powerful and um, it deserves to be active. Um, I think it's it's um, really, really important. So thank you for, um, I'm glad I'm here as, as an audience today. Thank you for coming. Questions here? I might, I might jump in in the, in, the, in, the, in the gap. I had a couple of questions as well coming out. One was about um, gender. Um, was there any difference between young men and young women in the research. And the other one's a bit bigger and kind of touching on some of the points here. Um, you mentioned um, that some of that kind of code of silence or non-response from the police seemed to have something to do with their um, protecting the image of the police, um, which, which makes a lot of sense. Um, it's really interesting though that of course the, the police have been kind of at the an organisation that have been named at the forefront of some diversity initiatives of late, and you know they're often in attendance when, when and Susan the boy is doing her talks and the like. And there's some real contradictions going on between the actual experiences that young people have and the, the claims that are made by the police. So, yeah. yeah, I'll answer that last question first, only because I'll probably forget. <laughs> <laughs> um, I we asked a question, and so far they were. There are two police of African heritage, one a Zimbabwean person, and I can't remember the other, where the other one is from. And I've been here in New Zealand for quite a while, and the police run recruitment drive, recruitment drive after recruitment drive to get more police African people, people of African heritage here. Now, at, on the day of the forum, that question was asked, and Joe said, oh, we have about 17, 18 African police, and I'm thinking to myself, no, I've done my research. I know of only two. But I didn't want to question him because, I, out of respect, and because if he said that, he would know statistics. Turns out later, I thought, I'm going to check on this. 16 of them were white South Africans, or white 
Even and I said to Joe, you know, that's not what we were talking about when we were talking about people of African heritage. You knew that. And um, but then I thought someone was saying the the problem with the police as it is now, if now they know the, the youth know when they stop, they know it's a matter of racism. If an African police is there, they can't use that because someone will always be able to point where well, it was an African police who did that without realizing that the African police will be co-opted into that police culture. Because if Wally, as a young man, as a young police officer, went out to hunt those niggers, as the police, the white police referred to young Mardi at that time, if he could do that as young Mardi, then what would the African police they would do the same thing, but so far in all the years of recruitment, they've only managed to increase, increase it, I think, by now to three. And talking to people that have wanted to be police, they said, if it's not, um, they haven't passed this test, it's a physical test, and they haven't passed the physical test. So there's always been a stumbling block to increasing the presence of police, of African police. Whether the increase will be a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. Thank you, Thank you for coming. Were there any differences around gender? Oh yeah, around, um, the the women said they were all also harassed by the police, but not to the extent. Most of the brutality have been with towards the, the men, and I suppose the the boys. Yes, I. What it says that fear. You see a, a a black person, and you think you put a whole lot of characteristics to them, that there's somebody to be feared, there's somebody to be afraid of, there's somebody to call the police on. And not they don't have that fear of, of females. And, and maybe it's a physical thing or maybe don't, they don't see them, but the women would talk about their brothers or their uncles being called. But I knew there were women who had been stopped and so they were the ones who talked about it. The girls were a lot mouthier too. To the police too, and they, they talk, but the boys were more physical. Mm. I guess that's where, as you said, these things connect not just to local police practices, but also stereotypes of the global yeah. and police practices that yeah. are global as well. Mm. Um, I was curious about possibilities or or whether there is any solidarity between targeted groups, and you mentioned Māori and mm. Colony, but is there any coordination around this issue? Um, and, and you know, so that it's not just one group yeah. uh, coming back to the police, but actually a coordination of different groups. You know, David, that was a sad thing, one of the sad things that came out of the report, because first they, they knew that it was being treated the same way as Māori and this group, but then you talk, when you talk to them further on, they realize that some, and I talked to a group in they say they were out in Glen Innes, and they say um, that the police stopped them and saw a group of Māori and Pacific people and didn't stop them. And they said, why don't they go after them? And, and it's gotten to a point now where the police are, through their actions, are able to divide and rule. And, 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 and not target, not target Māori when you have Africans, or not target Pacifica when you have Africans. And they see now that they're also being discriminated in terms of Māori and Pacifica, even though some of them know that the Māori and Pacifica people are also, also be a, the racial, um, uh, be a racism, have a held to account because of the racist practices of the police, then they, they are now beginning to feel that they are even worse, more discriminated by. And, and to me, that is sad because they need to realize racism is racism. There's not a certain level of it. And to now not have that solidarity with modern physical, it's a sad thing. And the police, I think, know exactly what they're doing when they see a group of Africans and a group of Māori and pick out only the Africans. They know, they know exactly what they're doing. Um, because if it was a group of Māori and a group of Pākehā, they would have take the Māori, they would arrest Māori. So the police are very, very aware of what they're doing. But the thing is, though, at the forum, 
I don't know if you know Sina Brown Davies. She, yeah, yeah, yeah. She stood up and said to the youth after they spoke, she said, it's, a good, it's good that you have spoken now and that this report is out, if only to avoid the mass incarceration of African youth as has happened to Maori youth. And the youth took that on board because it was a very strong statement. Mm. Because first it was Maori, then Pacifica, and African youth. And next. Can I ask? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, another sort of related question, yeah. which overlaps a little bit of what Francis was talking about as well, is just these distinctions. Because what about also? you know, the broad spectrum of people from an Asian background, you know, there's lots of, I mean, is there discrimination playing out in that? And what can we learn there about maybe whether it's perceptions of migrants which are framing police actions or perceptions of, of race and targeting specific races? I, I can't answer that because I haven't done research with okay. African youth and the experiences um, with the police. What I can tell you though is the myth of the model minority holds, mm. and, um, and 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 I think that's very pervasive. And people, particularly of say Chinese, Korean, Japanese, are not seen to be a problem, and they don't hold that fear for people as people have of of African people of darker skin. I mean, it's all you you know. It's um, that. It, that's not hidden and it's, you know, that's no secret. So I, I, I can't answer that, what it is for them. But what I do also know is that this Saturday, because I'll be going to it, they're hosting a, a, and you guys may also be aware of it, France, they are looking at safer communities and they want to host a forum, safer communities. And I'm wondering, and there's a, one of the sessions is on um, business. And uh, they want to look now at safer communities for business and for et safer, community, safer ethnic communities is what it is. And they want to address the dairy owners and those people that are being targeted mm. by largely Maori and Pacific people. And my question and my colleagues' questions are, well, are you going to then target the Chinese triads who cause the drug problems among Pacific people? Why are you targeting our oh, Maori and Pacific people for the grand of I'm not saying it's good to go rob dairies, but I'm saying what, what, who really are you targeting? And then are you targeting the Indian and Chinese um, restaurant owners or laundry cleaners who have um, who exploit migrants? So there is that perception that. There's a certain group and a certain type of crime that you ignore, and a certain group of people and a certain type of crimes they commit that you target. Which then play a role in reinforcing those things. Because of you see the higher conviction rates, yes. which then turn into statistics. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. That, that can then be used to back yeah. up the claims yeah. that in the first place may not have been. Exactly. Yeah. And it, it, it does not help anyone because the people of Indian heritage, Chinese heritage, will go continue to hold these perceptions of a particular group of people. If these sorts of forums continue. I had a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I've done a bit of research with the uh, um, Pacifica communities and Maori uh, communities, and I'm aware that there's some specific organizations that work work with them and what came a, a, across in that research was that these organizations sometimes serve as liaison with other bodies so for example they can serve as liaison with doctors they can serve, serve as liaison with the police sometimes and i was curious whether you see any of that happening with the african communities that you talk to where somebody goes in maybe as a social worker but then discovers that there are other issues happening and then you know decides to broaden their mandate as it were and help these people relate better with the say the police in this in instance is any of that happening margaret you know uh that's a good question because 
have looked for it. In, in doing this research, we've, there's a, we found out that there are other compounding problems such as fangying out or fostering out Africans who are being fostered out into Pakeha homes and not into African homes because African homes don't meet the criteria for, for um, the Ministry for Children because they don't have one child per home. Well, that's not how many African communities live. So they foster them out to Pakeha who, um, who have a completely different lifestyle. So in doing the research, a number of, of, of um, issues also came out. But in terms of whether they, um, they have um, sort of like Jeffrey point out areas for restorative justice or places to go, they do not. Not at, and that was one of the things, one of the recommendations, Margaret, that came out that they need sort of little call centers or people they can call on or organizations who be there with the youth so that they do not even get anywhere near a prison cell or a court because once they get there, that's basically it for them. They've got a taste of it and, and it's downhill from, from there. But we put that in the recommendations, we've spoken to all, everybody has those recommendations, but all they come back to is funding, who's gonna set it up. So our COFI, which is the African Communities Forum here, said we'll look into it, but they're a community organization, they, they're time poor. So there is nothing there that they have for African youth, that they have for Maori, um, I, I do not know what they have for Pacifica um, people. But you know, an interesting thing that Wally said to me, I said, because Wally said he was clear on telling the police, we are to reduce the, 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 the um, incarceration rates for youth, find alternatives. And I, and I said, what has happened? He said, it hasn't changed. He said, to his mind, things have gotten worse for them. And so, you know, it is not about all the practices that are put in place. It is really just changing their approach to people that are different from them. What is wrong for a policeman seeing a group of, of African youth hanging on the street for a policeman to go his way and let the African youth go their way? Or for the Maori youth to go their way? Why do you have to stop them? Why do you not have a different approach to them? So you can put in as many practices, because there are many practices and true, maybe less and less Maori youth uh, are being sent to course. But if the prison percentage of Maori being 50% of the prison population has not changed in all these years, and for women it is even worse, what, how, it's not going to be any different for Africans until that, that institutional racism that takes place in the police stops. I cannot see really any other way. Okay. Let's see if there are any last um, questions um, before we wrap things up. Just the last comment, maybe. Yeah, not a question. I'm just looking at uh, the picture here on Diversity Works website of uh, the New Zealand Police winning the Diversity Award in 2016. <laughs> Uh, and uh, for their efforts with gender relations, I think gender diversity in the organization, and it's just amazes me. It's the same year that the research was done, right? To, um, and I wonder what it actually means at the end of the day for an organization to be able to win a diversity award when at the same time we have this evidence of uh, pervasive institutional racism in the organization. You know, the police have one of the best marketing teams ever. Mm one of the best branding and marketing teams ever. Yeah, yeah, a lot of branding. That was evident. I was at the um, Africa Day celebration um, earlier this month, well, not earlier this month, but this month. Um, and they had a recruitment sort of um, package. A couple of people came in and they brought in people who are um, doing this sort of pre-recruitment cadets type program and the um the message was that the, the police is a diverse place and they want to have um they want to have more people from the african community coming in and they want to recruit they want to recruit young africans but the the person that they brought in as an example of um of this was a, a was a white south african kid and he was talking about his um african background and and how he feels great that this is being represented in, in, in 
the police, but that's not that's not what what's needed, and it doesn't serve any other purpose. And I was I was standing there thinking, knowing what I know about how the police treats um, African youth, I was thinking, why in the world would you want to join, and then be on the hunt for your own? That it just it seems completely counterintuitive, and I. Yeah, there's a lot of hypocrisy and a lot of, yeah, it's just very discrepant the way that they're presenting themselves and, and, and how it is. You know, it's, it's um, just in seeing that I have two members of my family in police. My, my husband is Samu and so my nephews in police force. And they were lovely boys with open minds, open hearts. And within six months of coming out of the academy, it was... Um, Expressions like, I'd rather kill them before they kill me. I'd rather be carried by, judged by 12 and be carried by. The whole attitude had changed. And they were working in South Auckland areas. And it's still, and it is amazing what you can do to someone's mind within that time in the academy. Within six months, lovely, inclusive young men that I knew were people, two people that I did not recognize. Yeah. And that raises the question of how much diversification of an institution such as the police can actually achieve when, you know, it's not about a few bad apples, it's not, it's not about white police officers, it's an institutional problem. Mm. Yeah. And a lot of that diversification is just an attempt to sort of to perpetuate, um, not even perpetuate, but to contain diversity. Mm -hmm. Because that's one of the things that that's a very sort of white fear. That's a very colonial white fear of being overtaken by mm -hmm. others, various others. Yeah. And so presenting an image of diversity going, well, there, there we go. We've done our job and that's it. So you can't complain now about this type of racism, about this type of targeting, about that, because we have all of those in our, mm -hmm. in our crew. So we can't possibly be. Mm. The things that you're accusing yourself. Yeah. And people do buy into that. They haven't diversified, diversified their thinking at all. Yeah. All right, well, it uh, leaves it to me to, um, to thank Camille for a, you know, a great um, presentation and I think a really, obviously, a really important topic and a good conversation to follow that. Um, I'd be interested to see how this goes next so thank you very much for coming up here and everyone for, for linking in um, just before we uh, we sign off just a note there is uh, another um, uh, the next migration research network seminar uh, is in June um, and will be Sally Liu uh, linking in from Massey Albany uh, presenting in relation to her research um, on uh, family uh, intergenerational family networks amongst Chinese migrants um, but details of that will be announced in the next few weeks if you're on the list. And if you're not, uh, let me know and, um, and we can keep you on the list. Okay. I want to say thank you all for coming and staying. <laughs> and thank you most of all for the questions because it helps me to think about what I do too. So thank you very much for that. <laughs>